Martha Nussbaum, welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's a great pleasure. Well, I really look forward to this conversation. Um, I have a question sort of before we get uh, properly into the different subjects we'll explore today, which is what actually is a moral philosopher and what is this strange um, enterprise of ethics, of trying to uh, think about uh, how one should act in the world? Yeah. Well, okay, I'll first say what most people think it is, and then I'll, I have a rather different view. Um, it's really the general idea is started with Socrates, who thought most people don't pause to think and they don't summon their beliefs into explicitness. And therefore, they are guided by custom, convention, authority, and they've never stopped to sort out what they really think. So what most people who teach moral philosophy do is just try to conduct that kind of Socratic inquiry, get people to be more critical, more conscious, and therefore to discuss with others more in that spirit of critical awareness rather than just saying, oh, I think this. So I think that's worthwhile. But I also think that in a pluralistic culture where people get their ethical views from many different sources, some religious and some secular, we have to be very careful about not pronouncing and not steering in one direction rather than another. And therefore, I think ethics is, has got quite narrow constraints. But political philosophy has to try to get to principles that could guide the whole society. And therefore, I, I agree with the great John Rawls, who was my teacher, that we need to make sure the political principles are, are narrow enough and they're thinly formulated enough that they don't use concepts that others would completely reject. So, for example, you would not use the concept of the immortal soul. You would use a thinner concept of human dignity or, or something like that. And this is familiar terrain in international ethical discussions. So when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was formulated, got people from China, from Egypt and you know, France and so on. And they agreed on that whole idea that they had to formulate it in a kind of thin enough way that people from all the different religions could sign on to it. So, so that's what I see myself as doing and trying to get the basis for what Rawls called an overlapping consensus among the different views. So I see myself as doing political philosophy, not really moral philosophy or moral theory. That's, that's, that's fascinating. There's a lot in there. Um, let me stick with ethics or moral theory for a moment, and then I want to bring out how that is different from political philosophy as you're talking about it. You know, one of the things that strikes me in particular in, you know, academic moral philosophy or ethics um, but as a result, also in a lot of the courses that people who aren't necessarily philosophy majors might uh, encounter when they fulfill a distribution requirement in something like moral reasoning in college, is that it has a pretty narrow focus. Um, a friend of mine likes to call it, you know, what is naughty and what is nice, right? It can seem as though the sort of enterprise of ethics of moral philosophy is to sort of look around the world at uh, people and actions and entity and say, this is good, that is bad. And that's a kind of very strange orientation towards the world. I know that in some of your mm -hmm. thinking, you've been critiquing uh, that kind of narrow way of thinking about right or wrong, or thinking about what a worthwhile life for people is. So before we sort of delve down into political philosophy more specifically, and then specifically how political philosophy applies to animals, um, uh, how can we have a broader understanding of how to reflect about uh, a worthwhile life? Well, I think actually that would be a very bad philosophy class that would just make a list of naughty and nice. I don't know anyone who does that. So I think it's a misconception and a stereotype that it doesn't have much connection to what's actually going on. What's going on is much more Socratic, trying to elicit from people their reasons for doing what they do. And that can happen without any kind of prescriptive element. You just get each person to clarify what they're doing and get them to think. Now, of course, once you think and you formulate your reasons, you notice that a lot of the things you think are full of contradictions. And this is what Socrates brought out in the dialogues. And then you might change your actual view because you see you're not, you're kind of a mess and you straighten out your, your views and make them more coherent. And of course, that also conducts 
that leads to a different way of conducting discussions with others. And to me, I think this is most the most valuable part of a required philosophy class. As you become more aware of why you believe what you believe and how it all fits together, you also see other people in a different light. They're not just the enemy or people who are the other side, but instead they're people who have themselves reasons for what they think. And some of those reasons might dovetail with some of your own reasons. So then you start sorting things out. And again and again, in writing about liberal education, I, I find people telling me that they never realized that you could actually argue on behalf of a position that you don't hold, that you could actually have a classroom debate where you're assigned the side that you don't actually agree with. But to me, that's a crucial contribution, not just to one's life, where it's good to be wide awake and kind of know why you're doing what you're doing, but especially to our political culture. We're not just yelling at one another across the great void, but we're trying to sort out why. And then that classroom debate is going to be a model that people could take into the larger society. And so you were hinting earlier at a distinction between um, what some people say is conceptions of good versus conceptions of right, um, between a comprehensive view of what is worthwhile in life versus a more narrow political set of conceptions about what is just in the way in which we deal with each other in political society. So how is it that our thinking uh, should be constrained by an awareness that we're not going to have exactly the same conception of what the good life is, exactly the same conception of what in a transcendental sense is just yeah. in a liberal society. Yeah, I think a long time ago, people who were liberals like John Stuart Mill used to think that you know, religion would just vanish from the earth and we would be reasoning together about politics in a way that was free from the different religious traditions. And that wasn't just in the West. I'm actually teaching tomorrow a course that includes Rabindranath Tagore, the great Indian philosopher. And he too thought he had this humanistic religion that he called the religion of man. He thought we would all converge on that. But now we see that doesn't happen, that under conditions of free inquiry and freedom of speech, people actually dovetail very little. They have different religions, different comprehensive views that are some religious and some, for example, Marxism would be secular. And then the question is, how can we then reason together about politics where we have to do stuff together? And so the idea that I and others have is that then we have to be especially careful that we narrow the scope of our inquiry. We're not going to formulate principles about the afterlife, for example, where you're never going to get any agreement. And yet you have to have a content that directs political action and political distribution. And then when you formulate that content, it's very important, I think, to do it in a thin way, not using divisive concepts. So we wouldn't use the concept of the class struggle in the Marxian sense, we also wouldn't use the concept of the immortal soul in the religious sense. And we try to think of things where we could meet on the same terrain. And then let's hope that people's larger comprehensive doctrines could be grafted onto that in their own minds. So somebody might say, well, I don't just mean human dignity. I really am thinking of the immortal soul, but I'll use the term human dignity because my fellow citizens don't all agree that there is an immortal soul. And so we can talk in this thinner way when we're deciding what to do politically. So <clears throat> let me put a couple of objections to this, and I'll start with a kind of more moderate objection and then try to ventriloquate the objection that uh, opponents of liberalism have put to me as I've been debating with them and trying to defend yeah. liberalism to them. So the narrow objection is simply one of sort of how to actually understand each other. So so, so, so the idea, broadly speaking here, right, is that um, we live in a coercive society that is very diverse, right? A society in which you will have a very different set of ideas about what is good and bad and what motivates us and what kind of life we should lead. And we also have laws that uh, threaten you with you know, terrible consequences if you don't obey them. Um, and so for me to say, look, you know, I think we should worship God in a particular kind of way. And so I'm going to try and use the law in order to coerce you to do the same. Uh, that seems very unjust. And therefore, we should sort of limit 
the kind of moral considerations that we invoke in arguing for law, for example, right? Um, but people might say that if the way we do that is simply translate the true reasons for what we believe into these uh, sort of bad imitations of them, that doesn't make that animus go away. Um, it, it simply cloaks it in a way that might be unhelpful. So I might still be trying to ban abortion, let's say, and I've recognized, look, we should, you know, talk in public reason um, in ways that don't invoke our ultimate uh, uh, comprehensive doctrines that, that drive us towards what political beliefs will hold. So rather than talk about the idea that, as a, I'm not a Catholic, but as a Catholic, I might believe that, um, you know, uh, uh, life starts at conception, uh, I talk, uh, you know, more broadly about human dignity. But doesn't that just cloak what I'm actually trying to do, make it harder for me to explain myself to my fellow citizens without therefore stopping me from trying to impose my preferences on the rest of society? And isn't that a reason to be skeptical of um, the kind of limitations that somebody like John Rawls thought should apply to public reason? Well, first of all, I think you know, the old maxim, hard cases make bad law. The case of abortion is one of the hardest cases in our society. And I think that's one where it's particularly difficult to carry on an argument in terms of public reason alone. Let me I'll come back to that case. But for most things where we have to talk about, let's say, the distribution of health care or other goods in a society, I think it's possible to find this neutral meeting place where, for example, the reasons of a believing Catholic for wanting everyone to have access to health care will be very different, maybe, you know, in the theology from my reasons as a Reformed Jew for wanting everyone to have access to health care. But, you know, we can meet and we, we can talk about those things and there's no big impediment. And I think, the, you know, if we start with the basic idea that we want to live with others who are different on terms of fair cooperation, that's an essential starting point. But if you have that, then you can do pretty well with very many topics. And I have in our law school started a program of what are called Nussbaum lunches, where at lunch, because people often sign up for classes around their politics, so I don't get so many of the conservative students in my classes. But if they sign up for one of these lunches, which I usually teach with a more conservative faculty member, then they discuss the topic with other students who disagree for 90 minutes. And I found that works really quite well, that we, we learn to understand one another better. We thought the abortion topic would just be the death knell for the Nostrom lunches. And my conservative, well, he's a libertarian, I wouldn't say he's really conservative, Will Bode, but he's a well-known libertarian blogger. He actually was were very worried. And his wife, who's quite left-wing, said, you know, Will, that's goodbye to the Nostrom lunches. But, you know, there, I think we have to go beyond brawls a bit because people need to explain where they're coming from. I think if they just use the language of public reason, you're quite right. People feel constrained and they feel they can't explain themselves. So people did more of that. But when they did, of course, you found out that not all Catholics had the same view. Of course, some were aware that Aquinas thought that the fetus wasn't a person until just before birth. And you know, so we started discussing things in a much more open-ended way. And there were students who were Catholics who had become worn out by the pro-life movement because they thought it wasn't supporting life enough. You know, so so they had that inter-Catholic discussion. And then there were Jews who had a different point of view. And there were many, many other religious points of view. And we found that we were listening to each other. And I, I think that's the crucial thing that people are actually able to listen. Because usually, you just don't talk to such people. I mean, usually those conservative students wouldn't be taking my feminist philosophy class or whatever. But of course, if they listen, then they learn something about the other side. And I was so delighted when at the end, later in the day, I ran into the most conservative Catholic student in the elevator. And she just looked at me and she said, thank you, because I had listened. And, you know, I had just not said, oh, you're the demon from the other side. So I think we can still get a long way with that. And it, it reinforces a kind of goodwill to approach the subject together in a certain spirit. And of course, there are most topics, like another one we did recently was the legalization of hard drugs. 
there, you know, the terrain is much more open. And in fact, I have a much more conservative so-called view than Will Bode, who's a libertarian. He thinks there shouldn't be any laws against any drug. So, you know, we find out things about how no side is monolithic and we learn to listen to the, uh, the plurality on the other side. So I actually think sometimes going beyond the narrow limits of public reason is quite helpful. Yeah, it strikes me these are two very different visions of how society would look, right? One where we're saying, look, um, we're not really bringing our full selves to the public conversation in order to constrain the danger that we might impose on each other. And the other that says, no, you know, the right liberal spirit is to say, I don't want to force you to coerce you in ways that might be unjust, given that you have a very different conception of how you want to lead your life. But precisely to have an empathy for you, it's helpful for you to tell me how you see the world. And it's helpful for me to tell you how to see the world. That's that's actually two different liberal sensibilities. Now, let's go to the... Let me just the, add one thing. That Rawls didn't actually say people in what he called the background culture shouldn't do that. He actually thought it was fine for them to do that. It was just that in certain political roles, in particular, he mentioned the Supreme Court justice writing an opinion, then you shouldn't give your reasons for that decision, binding on the whole country in terms of your personal beliefs. So so I think he's been misunderstood a lot. And, and that's a much more reasonable restriction, yeah. of course, if the Supreme Court justice said, well, I've determined that life starts at conception and therefore yeah, uh, yeah. I'm going to make this ruling, that would be deeply alienating to anybody who doesn't share that that that, that right. belief. Now, now, the broader critique that... Uh, uh, post-liberals who I've debated in various contexts have put to me, um, which I don't find to be intellectually convincing, but that clearly has a real emotional force to them and to others as well, is that uh, that, 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 that evolution that you invoked from uh, a perfectionist liberalism of somebody like John Stuart Mill to a more political liberalism of somebody like John Rawls is somehow a con job, right? What they claim is that um, you know, liberalism at the beginning had this idea that religion would uh, uh, fade away. I don't think that all liberals had that even at the beginning, but right, that, that, that used to be what liberals said. Um, and now they sort of pay lip service to the idea that liberal institutions and societies are neutral and that people with a broad variety of viewpoints can live equally and fully among them, including those who are deeply religious. But in practice, that just isn't the case, right? This is just a sort of thin veneer of excuse in order to actually exclude people who do have those strong religious beliefs or who do have more traditional beliefs. And so in practice, if you are somebody who has a, a traditional set of moral views or if you are somebody who has a strong religious faith, you have to reject liberalism if you want to sustain a society in which you're going to be able to sustain your kind of moral and religious community. Um, how do you respond to that criticism? Um, uh, you know, I have my response, but I haven't found it to be as convincing as I was <laughs> well, hoping. So perhaps you can give me a better one. I mean, the first thing to say is, and I think a lot of people in the academy are guilty of what they say. That is, they do despise religious people and religious doctrines. And I think that's very unfortunate. And I think they're behaving badly when they do that. But, you know, really, I mean, I'm a religious person and I am a member of my synagogue and I, I do feel it's an important part of my life. Now, of course, Reform Judaism is about as kind of critical thinking oriented as any religion has ever been. But what I think is that Kant was right, that if you feel you're weak, and I think we're all weak, then we have a moral duty to join a group who helps strengthen our dedication to very good principles that we, we actually are inclined to hold. And so that's what I think about my religion, that it's it's a community of um, conscience that strengthens my vacillating adherence to, to good things. And of course, within which we have lots and lots of disagreements. We're about to have a big debate between me and the cantor about animal rights. So that'll be fun. But But then, you know, so I think that should be possible. And I never conceal my own interest in religion, and I try very hard to make it clear that I think it's perfectly compatible with being a political liberal. But uh, but then, I guess I think, look, there are some religions that have the view that they they project onto them. There are some evangelicals who think that critical thinking is bad and that you shouldn't be exposed to critical thinking. When I wrote my book on liberal, my first book on liberal education, Cultivating Humanity, I made a great point of including 
religious institutions in the database. So I had a chapter called Socrates in Religious Institutions. And what I found is that most of them really wanted Socratic debate, and they wanted this broader joining to a culture. And in fact, the Baptist institutions that were running aground a a foul of the Southern Baptist Convention on certain things about women's status, they had just left the Southern Baptist Convention. So I really didn't include very many Baptist schools in the final study because they were too, they had become liberalized. But, but I did find with Catholic institutions, of course, particularly the Jesuit institutions, but also even Notre Dame, which is a Congregation du Sacré-Cœur, a more conservative order. You know, they were prepared to defend academic freedom, academic pluralism, and they wanted that kind of debate. And this is why all Catholic institutions in the United States, but I think in, in, in the world, require two semesters of philosophy from everyone, because they think that kind of clarification and that kind of participatory debate is crucial. Now, so I guess there are some differences of opinion about what Mormonism is, and I engaged in that debate, and I still do, <clears throat> but I, I think <clears throat> that's a religion which sometimes has taken the position that we don't want students to learn critical thinking. I think that's inconsistent with Joseph Smith's views, and I've said that in my book, for which reason I'm on a list of people who may not be invited any longer to lecture at BYU, but that's another matter. I, so I think if you're a religion who's on the verge of taking or wants to take that more exclusionary position, then you're not going to want your students to learn much in the way of critical thinking. Philosophy at BYU is distinctly subordinated to the religion classes. And then it will be very hard for you to participate in that kind of critical culture. And that's too bad. And if there were a large enough proportion of the citizens of a country who belong to such religions, there would be a lot of difficulty, I think, for finding political common ground. But I also think that even within such religions, people don't really buy that because they actually want to talk to their neighbors about why they do what they do. And I know people who teach at very conservative Protestant institutions who find that they really they, they can get their students on the ground of exchanging reasons. Even if they start with a neutral example, let's say from sports, they can move them onto that ground because they want to talk about how you choose a doctor, how you choose your life partner, and they want to have reasons for what they do. So I don't think the number of people who have the very exclusionary view in the general population of those religions is so large. The religious leaders, it's a different matter. They get power from extinguishing debate. But but I I do believe that we have a lot of hope. I mean, just think of the way that the debate about same-sex marriage has changed with younger people coming up. And knowing more people who are lesbian and gay, it turns out that people under 35, a very large majority, even in evangelical schools, favor same-sex marriage because they know people who want to get married and they think marriage is a very good thing, etc. So I think on a lot of apparently divisive issues, people are able to move their religions ahead of them rather than being dragged backward by those religions. Yeah, um, yeah, I suppose, you know, one of the obvious rejoinders to that criticism of liberalism is that the United States in particular is a society in which religious faith continues to be very, very important and in which many people are you know, deeply committed to their religious traditions and are able to live with a great amount of freedom. Um, you know, The other point that always struck me about those post-liberal critiques is that they have a structural similarity, ironically enough, with certain progressives who reject free speech, which is to say that there are some progressives who reject free speech who uh, somehow assume that they're always going to be the ones making the rules about what kind of speech will be allowed and what kind of speech will not be allowed. And some of them have recognized in the last few months that that's not always going to be the case. Um, But it was, uh, you know, as I wrote before the last few months, a very naive belief to start off with. In the same way, we sort of, some of the post-liberals think, well, you know, if what most uh, uh, motivates you is an adherence to a certain set of religious beliefs, and if you think that those are sufficiently important, that, for example, your entry into heaven will depend on living in a community of people who all adhere to those rules and make it least likely that you might deviate from them, 
I can see why that's, uh, even as a non-religious person, I can see why it's a very motivating uh, point of view. Um, but what makes you think that you're going to be able to impose your views on the rest of society? Especially, for example, if, as many of these post liberals, uh, you know, you're a Catholic in a society that continues to be majority Protestant. Um, and, of course, that, too, is part of the origin of liberalism. You're talking about certain perfectionist liberals like John Stuart Mill in the 19th century who uh, perhaps had a belief in a certain kind of rationalism or of uh, certain forms of religious beliefs uh, giving way over time. But in its real origin, uh, it seems to me that liberalism was a solution to how we can live together with very different religious beliefs rather than having yeah. religious wars and so on, right? And yeah. and, and so there's, there seems to be a strange structural similarity between these two very unlike, you know, very different rejectors of liberalism uh, based on the fantasy. But I think anybody who, 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 you know, and there's a structural reason for that because it's based on the fantasy that... Um, you can build a society that's better than liberalism, and that always assumes that that society will, in fact, accord with your substantive preferences about how everything is going to run. Well, totally agree. And I'm very glad to be at a university that has a very clearly articulated and subst substantive and well defended free speech policy. It's known as the Stone Principles after my colleague Jeff Stone, who formulated them with his committee. And it defends any speech that's not a direct personal threat. I mean, so all of this is spelled out, but it invites conversation and inquiry from all points of view. And so we haven't run into these problems about, oh, you can have anti-Semitic speech, but you can't have racist speech. No, you can have any speech that is expressed in civil terms and doesn't disrupt the educational environment. But you, of course, you, you have to have it done in, in a certain civil way. And I think this has been very successful. Other universities like Princeton have adopted these principles, but it doesn't please those liberals who would like to ban speech that is, offends on grounds of gender or race. Now, what happens when somebody says something at our university that offends on grounds of gender or race is that people discuss it and the students explain why they feel offended. In fact, Jeff Stone himself uh, had this uh, kind of thing happen to him because he used a, a story that involved using the N-word, and he did it deliberately, thinking that it would make a good point because it was showing that the N-word in a certain classroom context was actually a valuable expression of the, 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 the disdain with which uh, white society hold, holds blacks, and you couldn't make that point without that word. Well, the students, you know, then had a meeting with him and they explained to him why they, number one, they felt you could make the point perfectly well without that word. And he, they suspected he might be doing it just for shock effect. Number, uh, I, I think they were right about that. Number two, you know, that you have to understand that certain words have a history that makes their very presence in the classroom toxic in such a way that it impedes learning. So, you know, you have that kind of discussion and see where it comes out. And if the, both sides are of goodwill, and of course, Jeff is of great goodwill and the students were too, then I think, you know, you can, you can get along. Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree at all. And I think the crucial thing is that we don't think that we would agree in the short run about anything, but it's just that we have an open mind and we're listening and we don't think that we can call the tune for others. Um, so one way of thinking about liberalism is that it's a set of rules about how we can live together in society, even though we have very, very different beliefs, and yet each be able to pursue our idea of how we want to spend our time on Earth, what are our priorities, whatever things that are most important to us, some of which may be chosen sort of ab novo at the age of 18, but some of which may be pre-given by the moral and religious communities into which we're born, we can simply continue to uh, uh, to be uh, to live up to the kind of responsibilities that those give us. It seems to me that liberalism uh, has greater difficulties coming to clear answers in cases where it's unclear whether somebody has full moral agency, um, and well, it's unclear whether somebody should be counted among the circle of people. Who have full moral rights. So, in a sense, I think that is what the dis debate about abortion is over, right? What is the moral status 
of a fetus, for example, and what does that mean for how we can uh, constrain what kind of medical con interventions we're going to license. That is, of course, often the case in controversial questions about education, right? To what extent can uh, a 13-year-old make choices for themselves? To what extent should parents be alone in making choices on their behalf? To what extent should the state be allowed to step in when it feels that parents are not living up to the kind of responsibility they have towards their children? But it seems to me that the same question is fundamentally at odds in the topic that is covered in your latest book, which is to say um, how we treat animals and how we should conceive of uh, the responsibilities we have towards animals and perhaps the rights that animals have in their own right. Yeah, I think this is a very long discussion. I don't expect that we're going to arrive at any consensus anytime soon. And rather like Peter Singer, who said similar things, I'd be very happy for people just to take these issues seriously, debate them, think about them when they buy meat and, and, and when they endorse practices like the factory food industry that cause great pain and suffering to animals. I want them to know. The first thing is we know a lot more than we used to know about the capacities of animals. There's a, a lot of science in my book, and I myself learned a huge amount while I was writing it because I knew a lot about elephants and a lot about whales, but I didn't know all that was known about rodents and all kinds of other animals. So scientists now know a great deal. And so I tried to make it clear that animal sentience is a very complicated thing. And of course, sentience itself, that is the ability to feel pain, to have a subjective point of view on the world, I think licenses a certain kind of respect, respectful treatment. We share the earth with these other sentient beings. And I wanted to put down, uh, uh, so to speak, to, to criticize a very common view that namely it's all organized in a rank ordering with the humans at the top, or maybe God at the very top, and then everyone else ranged below, by simply pointing to what we know. We know that birds have a sensory faculty of magnetic perception, perception of magnetic fields that we don't have at all. And for that reason, they're able to go all over the whole world and find their way. And we know that dolphins can echolocate. They can say what's inside an object they approach. I, I tell this story about how one trainer in a, in a private marine facility was able to be, she was told by her captive dolphin that she was pregnant before she herself knew that because the dolphin could sense that there was something growing inside and that woman hadn't yet had the pregnancy test. So, you know, animals can do these amazing things. And I think once you realize how complicated animals are, and of course, it's not just the ones that we tend to, to like, like elephants and dolphins, but it's also squirrels, mice, it, rodents are very intelligent creatures. They actually have one capacity that usually humans think only humans have. That is metacognition. That is, they can think about what other creatures think. When a squirrel is hiding a nut, it's got to be successful at thinking where will other squirrels look for that nut? It's got to avoid that. So, you know, people do know that their dogs can deceive them. And they, so they do ascribe metacognition to dogs. But squirrels, mice, you know, the world is full of animals who think in very, very complicated ways. Now, what does that all mean? We can still say, oh, well, knowing all that, I'm just going to say goodbye to all those other creatures. I count them for nothing. But we might at least start to think about First of all, the pain that we inflict on such creatures. And I want to say, you know, pain is very important, but it's not the only thing we do to these creatures. We deprive them of free movement very often. We do ruin their habitats. I've just been writing a lot on whales. I did a piece in the New York Review of Books anniversary issue about the fact that in the seas, which we think is wild, whales can't move around without being obstructed by, number one, noise made by container ships and propellers and also the, the oil riggers that send sonic bombs down to the ocean floor to chart the ocean floor. Number two, by plastic. Anytime somebody drinks from a plastic bottle and throws it away, that plastic is very likely not to be recycled but to end up in the ocean. And then 
when it's there, it's gleaming, it looks very appealing, and a whale will swallow it. But of course, then it can't digest it, and it will sit there, and probably more plastic will come in, and the whale ultimately can't take in any real food, and the whale will die. So there are all these things, even the practice of using sonar for the national defense has come under scrutiny because of the way it disrupts the whale's form of life. So if we know these things, we have to think, could we do what we do differently? Now, in the case of whales, there are lots of things we could do differently. For one thing, we could just set speed limits on these container ships. They would get where they're going, but they just get there a little more slowly. And there would be much less obstructed noise. We could certainly do what a lot of states and cities are doing, banning single-use plastic. And I think that's good for human health in, in many ways, too. Uh, so, you know, other things that we could do. Sonar has now been regulated by by a United States court so that the U.S. Navy can use what's called defensive sonar. But there's a kind of sonar it uses just in an exploratory way that is now illegal because of the way it obstructs the lives of whales. So there are many, many cases where we don't really need to do what we're doing. Lobster fishermen used to think can't fish for lobster without using a kind of line that gets wrapped around the body of the whale and cuts into it so that it gets more and more entangled as it thrashes around and it ultimately dies an extremely painful death. And this is a kind of whale that's highly endangered. So gradually people say, well, you know, there's another way of having a line that detaches from the lobster pot and you could think of using that. Unfortunately, the Congress refused to appropriate funds to subsidize the use of that new, more expensive kind of line on the part of the lobster fishermen. So, you know, we've got those problems too. And any time it takes congressional approval, as you know, it's going to take a long, long time. But anyway, my point is that we can get a lot of agreement on a lot of things, particularly, I would say, in countries that where the meat industry does not have a strangle grip on politics. I'm afraid our country is in real trouble that way. Imagine this, that the factory farming industry has been able to pass in many, many states laws that forbid speech about what actually goes on inside those farms. They're called ag gag laws, gag, gagging the speech about agriculture. And some of these laws have been thrown out by state Supreme Courts on free speech grounds, but there are about nine states that still have them because they think and this is what gives me hope. You know, the minute people actually know what's going on, they're going to change their dietary practices. I think that, you know, their power over politics is right now huge. We're today, the day of the Iowa caucuses. Any presidential candidate who doesn't go to Iowa and do a photo op with a pork sausage is in big trouble. And yet the pork industry is one of the worst. It puts these highly intelligent animals in what are called gestation crates, these metal slatted boxes just the size of their body. They can't lie down, they can't turn around, and they have to defecate through these slats into a sewage lagoon. It's a horrible life. It's a, a, a life not worthy of the dignity that that animal possesses. And if people saw that, and they then saw by contrast what a, a pig is in a different habitat, then they would think differently. I think one of the problems we have is that people do see elephants and whales in a, a more robust, not fully natural, but sort of natural habitat. But the animals we eat are screened from view, and we don't really see them as full beings, but, but only as things. So we need to change that. But the pork industry and the, the, the meat industry has a real hold over politics. You can't get confirmed to a position that deals with regulation that requires Senate confirmation without sitting down at the table with those people and saying, I'm not going to regulate against the meat industry. Whereas Europe is not in the same situation and Europe has advanced a great deal. And so you can kind of be contrasting the laws that regulate the factory food industry in the US and in Europe, you can see what happens if there's less obstruction from the meat industry. But I actually am hopeful about this because now we're getting meat that's grown from stem, stem cells hmm. in labs. 
And once that's widely marketed, and of course, they're going to try to say it's unsafe, blah, blah, blah. But once it is widely available, I mean, we see that the plant-based meat is already very popular, but the, this other meat would actually be meat. It would just not involve abuse of an animal. So I think we're gradually going to see that power diminishing. And I am glad to open the conversation that contributes to that diminution. So, so um, you know, if somebody listened to what you've been saying for the last minutes and is uh, broadly sympathetic, as uh, I certainly am, um, what consequences should we take from that? Right. So I'm somebody who um, does eat meat, um, who doesn't have particularly radical views about animal rights, but who certainly uh, rationally knows that everything that you've been saying rings true. Um, that, of course, there are a huge variety of animals, including ones that we use as farm animals, that we use as uh, the things we eat, that clearly have not just, uh, uh, you know, the ability to feel pain, but, but great cognitive uh, skills and abilities that are very different from ours as humans, but that are worthy of respect. And of course, um, uh, you know, I think in the abstract that we should uh, put in place the regulations and other things we need uh, to reduce the incredible cruelty with which we uh, treat, for example, the chickens that we eat for dinner or that give us the eggs that we have for breakfast. Um, but what's the next step here? What's the next step both in terms of our conception of the political space? What does it actually mean to think in terms of animal rights? And what do you think the next step is in terms of either political, voting, uh, mm -hmm. activist behavior or, or personal behavior? Do I need to become a vegetarian or a vegan? Am I simply being morally lazy by not taking that step? How should I reflect on this? I am very opposed to making people feel shame and saying, I'm not going to talk to you until you reform your practices. I think first step is to listen and learn. But you know, there's so many places where you can engage and make a difference that I think there, there's just, it's just endless. One way would just be to teach your children about animal lives and let them make their own choices and to foster programs in the schools that show videos of animal lives that educate in, in the broadest sense. Uh, another would just be to engage in politics at a local level. So the city of Chicago, for example, has a very active set of lawyers, the, the animal section of the Chicago Bar Association, thinking largely about companion animals, because that's what they deal with most, most nearly. And they've succeeded in banning puppy, well, puppy mills are terrible, terrible breeders that raise these dogs under very bad conditions, often with parasites and so on, but they conceal the conditions. And then they market them as purebred pets in pet stores. Now, the problem is that the puppy mills are mostly in other states. They're in Missouri, most of all. And Missouri is in the grip of that industry. And they did pass a law against it, but then the governor vetoed it. And so, so far, they haven't been able to do that. So then you have to just think, what can I do here in Chicago? And the city council of Chicago actually voted that no pet shop may sell an animal that might be from such a puppy mill. So the only way to do that, because they conceal their origins so well, is to say you have to adopt a shelter animal. That's the only way you can acquire legally an animal in the city of Chicago. And then it turned out that the puppy mills got around that one and they were saying, oh, we're a legitimate shelter. And they had these bogus fronts and they smuggled the puppy mill dogs under these bogus fronts and said they're shelter animals. So then they had to pass a different law and they had to define a genuine shelter animal in, in a more a tighter way. So, you know, you have to keep working because the opposition is always trying to get ahead of you. There are many, many other things. So you could just stop using single-use plastic. You can use cans and you could say, and I haven't yet succeeded in this with the law school because they think, oh, these plastic bottles are really recycled. And I presented the evidence. And I say at any conference that I'm organizing, they have to have cans, which are really recycled. And so they're willing to do it up to a point, but they're not willing to go the whole hog because it's 
more expensive. So, you know, you work on that. And I'm trying to work on that in my workplace. But you might also just do some writing, which is what I think I can do. And I, I thought, you know, given that I have the, some sort of ability to write, that that was a contribution that I could make. But there are plenty of other kinds of writing, like op-eds, local newspaper articles, and the Chicago Tribune I, I really love because every almost every day on the front page there's a story, and the reporters are really excellent. That They do stories about birds, for example. So there's some rare bird that's now nesting in on the lakeshore out here, and you learn about the animals in your city. So in short, what I think is, you just figure out what you care about and what you love, and you think, how, how can I contribute in that area that I really know about and with my own particular skills and interests? You don't have, I mean, as far as diet goes, I think it would be quite a good idea if people would gradually gravitate to either plant-based meat or the stem cell type meat. It's good. I mean, meat is not that great for your health anyway. And but animal agriculture contributes enormously to global warming. So there's the health issue, there's the global warming issue, and the stem cell meat is doesn't get around the health issue, but it does get around the global warming issue. It doesn't contribute belch methane out into the atmosphere. So you have to think about your diet in that way. Now I found that I myself, being an aging woman who's quite athletic and does 90 minutes of exercise every day. I need about 65 grams of protein per day in order to be healthy. And it turns out actually that plant-based protein, either it's a type that I can't digest, which is one problem, or if I can, it doesn't give me enough of the muscle building enzymes that I need. I was having problems of weakness. I mean, I'm now taking creatine supplements, which seems to make things better. But I, I do have some dairy in my diet, and I do still eat fish. And I have an argument in the book. I, I actually think that because fish, unlike most animals, live in the instant, they don't make elaborately, temporally extended plans, they don't suffer the harm of death in the same way that most animals and humans do. The, the most qualms I have about my own diet is dairy, because the dairy industry there's no way to think of it that it doesn't involve taking the calf from its mother. And that's a terrible loss to the mother and to the calf, of course. So I I mean, I think you could imagine how to reform it, but it would be not profitable at all. So I'm worried about the dairy industry. But right now I still eat yogurt quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I think we shouldn't, we shouldn't judge. I, we, we have to be people who are trying to do the best we can. And if we try to do the best we can and we pay in and contribute in some way, I don't think people should be wagging a finger. At I think that's just, first of all, it's very counterproductive, but, uh, but it's not a good way to be in the world. But uh, I think that, 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 that spirit of being a happy Warrior for animal rights is, yeah. is 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 an important model. Um, you know, in, when it comes to climate change and the environment, I'm quite attracted to a tradition that's sometimes called eco-modernist, which is to say that I think it's a great mistake when it comes to climate change to basically tell people that the way to fix the problem is for all of us to go back to being poor and not having access to energy and not be able to go on holiday and be a little uncomfortably hot in the summer and a little uncomfortably cold in the winter. Um, and there are, in fact, with investment and trade-offs and costs and regulation, um, uh, but there are ways to build an economy of a future in which we continue to be affluent, in which, in fact, the many people around the world who have a great daft of energy, a great daft of mobility, a great daft of access to all of those wonders of modern civilization get access to those things. And nevertheless, yes. we have transformed our economy in such a way um, that we don't um, uh, make the morally indefensible choice of making life miserable for future humans. I, I wonder whether there's a kind of parallel here, right, where um, there is at least in part a technological solution to the question of animal rights, um, which is these uh, you know, actual animal-based meat products that don't involve yeah. um, having to uh, raise and then kill 
uh, sentient beings. Um, and I certainly look forward to, uh, you know, a day in which I don't have to make a choice between, you know, ordering what looks to me like a delicious steak, um, but feeling morally queasy about it, um, or foregoing that pleasure because I'm being moral, which is always a solution that is unlikely to work at scale. So I very much hope that we're going to get there technologically so that people can, you know, have a delicious meal and a nutritious meal, but without um, that suffering. It did make me wonder about the strained conditions of our moral views. It seems to me that often when we look back at practices in the past that we uh, consider to be deeply immoral or unethical, uh, have trouble understanding how hard it is to actually act in these moral ways when your necessity or even your convenience greatly depends upon it. Right? When we're looking at um, these children working in the 19th century in coal mines mm -hmm. or in factories, um, you know, which seems so obviously brutal and uh, morally wrong. And how is it that so many contemporaries didn't see that? Well, if in economic terms, there was a need for it in a way uh, that there isn't now, and um, that makes it that made it harder to see. And I wonder whether, in, by the same token, if we do end up with really good meat products that don't, in fact, require the raising and killing of sentient animals, whether 50 or 100 years from now, people will look back at this moment and think, how could these people eat meat? It's so obvious that it's wrong, but part of their moral clarity will come from the fact that they don't face the same trade-off. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with pretty much everything you say. In fact, it reminds me, I, as I mentioned, I'm teaching this course in Indian political and legal thought. And Gandhi had exactly the view you're criticizing, that we should go back to the village level of life, spin our own cloth, et cetera, et cetera. And Nehru just couldn't stomach that. Uh, their letters are really interesting because Nehru said, why do you think that life in a village is so great? It's usually not very good. And therefore, people are not more virtuous, but they have more incentives to behave badly because they're under such stress and unhappiness. So, yes, I totally agree that we should prefer technological solutions whenever there are some. Now, in general, so I have this position that I derive from Hegel, namely when you're faced with a tragedy, namely there are two things you have to choose between and both seem wrong, what you must do is to look way ahead and say, is there a solution that could obviate or up, lift up of the dilemma? And so one, one case would be the stem cell meat that you mentioned. Another would be medical experimentation. Now, right now, you know, these experiments on animals are necessary to provide drugs that do great good, not only for humans, but also for other animals. But of course, they're really very objectionable. And if you look at how animals are treated, that's not, it's not acceptable. But if you look way ahead, and it's not even that far ahead, computer simulation and robotic techniques will soon displace this flawed medical experimentation. I mean, studies of rats are not very good at projecting to humans anyway, and people know that. And gradually, as you know, in surgery, there's more and more robotic surgery that's absolutely amazing what they can do with not, without general anesthesia and so on. And so I think gradually, too, there will be experiments using technology that will be able to get rid of experimenting on animals. And so I'm quite delighted by the future in that respect. So every time that we have a, an impasse, we should look at it in that spirit and see what else could we do? Now, there were cases in India that I've studied in, in my work in development where parents thought, how can I send my child to school? Because I need to use the child. This is your old story, but it still goes on. I need to use the child for labor. But then what the government of first Tamil Nadu and then Kerala did was to say, well, you know, this government can intervene in a helpful way. We can have, first of all, flexible school hours so that the children can do both. But then we will provide in the school a nutritious midday meal. And now it's been generalized to the whole nation. And the Supreme Court of India even prescribes how many calories and how many grams of protein must be in the midday meal in the school. And that cuts through that dilemma to at least some extent, because then there it's a win-win rather than a win-lose in sending your child to school. 
So they'll see that, you know, people are clever and they can innovate their way around a lot of these terrible problems if they just are approached with goodwill rather than the sense of, oh, humanity is bad. This is the Anthropocene and we're all bad creatures. No, I think we're resourceful creatures who can solve problems. Um, since you mentioned Gandhi, um, in the context of uh, vegetarianism, I can't help but cite uh, George Orwell, who has a really fascinating uh, essay on Gandhi that he wrote yes, uh, briefly after Gandhi was assassinated and briefly before Orwell himself passed away. Um, and, you know, Orwell is very ambivalent about Gandhi. He has great admiration for him, but he also says that in the first line of the essay that you must always beware of saints in politics. And he does think of Gandhi as a kind yeah. of saint in, in politics. But the most cutting line of a piece, and it's a little bit harsher in tone than the rest of the piece, is when Orwell reflects on uh, the choice that Gandhi gives to some of his relatives of whether or not to consume animal products when they're sick and when it says that those animal products might uh, save them. And Gandhi basically encourages them not to, but leaves the choice to them. Um, uh, uh, you know, if a, if a decision had been solely his own, or rights, he would have forbidden the animal foods, whatever risks might be. There must, Gandhi says, be some limit to what we will do in order to remain alive. No, sorry, excuse me. There must, he says, be some limit to what we will do in order to remain alive. And the limit is well on this side of chicken broth, which I thought was always <laughs> one of the <laughs> well, best. Uh, yeah, I mean, Gandhi... I, I, I always had such a negative view of this aspect of Gandhi, and I have to correct it a little bit by saying, I mean, the, the, my friend Amartya Sen always reminds me what a charismatic leader he was for the independence movement. And it's possible that he would not have had the success he had in getting the British out of India if he hadn't been such a strange religious character, because people accepted him as a wise guru. Uh, so maybe, you know, someone like Nehru, who was much more sane, and he's really, my heroes in politics are the more sane sort of people, Nelson Mandela, Nehru, uh, you know, because they really thought about things in a much more complicated way. But I think Gandhi really was complicated, too, and he was very strategic. And maybe, you know, he wouldn't have, he, he couldn't have had Nehru leading the Great Salt March. You had to have someone like Gandhi who in his body exemplified a kind of asceticism and renunciation that's resonated with large groups of people. So, you know, I I dislike utterly his, a lot of his substantive views, but I have to say he was in some ways a, a great leader. But Nehru is my favorite. And and, 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 and and that is similar to the judgment all comes to, you know, who says that, you know, one may feel as I do a sort of aesthetic distaste for Gandhi, one may reject the claims of sainthood made on his behalf, for all points out that he never made any such claims for himself. Right. Uh, one may even reject sainthood as an ideal in politics and therefore uh, feel that some of Gandhi's basic aims were, were anti-human or even reactionary, but regarded simply as a politician and compared with the other leading political figures of our time, how clean a smell he has managed to leave behind. <laughs> Um, well, so, so there is. So uh, now, I have to say, on caste, not such a clean smell. His hmm. debate with um, Bedkar about caste, where Gandhi is saying, I mean, it's again part of his reactionary Hinduism, where he says, well, we get rid of untouchability, but we keep caste as an externally imposed division of labor. So you're born into caste X and you have to do X all your life. And so if you're a sweeper like Ambedkar, you have to be a sweeper. You can't be a lawyer. And Ambedkar says, how ridiculous. That's a total abnegation of the ideal of freedom and choice that most people have. And of course, the uh, obligations of most lower castes are to do things that most people wouldn't choose to do, like sweeping. So Ambedkar converted to Buddhism with his entire caste. And he, he had this debate with Gandhi where he totally he repudiated the entire system as a mandatory, no, ideals are one thing, but as a mandatory division of labor, I think the caste hierarchy has to be totally rejected. So, you know, there were that's the bad smell. So I wasn't actually going to ask you about that whole strain of your work, but since we've somehow wound up talking about India and your work with Amartya Sen, um, I would be remiss not to. Um, uh, how should we think in the context of development as the basic goal of public policy? And why do you think that uh, thinking um, of the capabilities that people have, the basic option sets that they have in terms of 
uh, uh, what small choices they can make for their lives is an improvement on uh, the ways in which we've normally thought about uh, the the goals of development. Okay. Well, of course, what was on the scene when Amartya first and then I came along was measuring how well a country or region was doing by simply looking at gross domestic product per capita. Now, the first thing that's wrong with that is it's just an average. So it can give high marks to nations or states that have great inequality because it doesn't ask how the people at the bottom are doing. But the second thing that's wrong is it doesn't disaggregate the different parts of a life. You might be doing pretty well in one area and not in another. And so we wanted to say that the options that people have are have to be plural. And they you have to include things like health care, bodily integrity, all the things that I eventually put on my list of capabilities, which Amartya doesn't use. But anyway, you know, the idea of getting a much more complicated picture of development. There are states, and in particular Gujarat, where the current Prime Minister Modi is from, that was doing quite well by gross domestic product per capita, very badly on education, very badly in maternal mortality. So once you start listing the things that actually matter to people, you get a different set of answers. Then if you moved up one level in terms of adequacy, you might get to utilitarianism, which measures how well you're doing in terms of the satisfaction of people's preferences. That's a lot better because it's really about what politics is doing for people, but it still has some problems. Number one, it's still an average and it therefore doesn't tell you how the worst off are doing. Number two, it still aggregates the different parts of the life together it just talks about utility, this all-purpose placeholder for different, many different and incommensurable types of choices. But number three, people can feel satisfied because they don't know any other option. This is the problem that economists call adaptive preferences. They can say, oh, women don't usually go to school, so I'm, I'm satisfied with the amount of schooling I have. And that's often a reinforcement of an unjust status quo. And then finally, it, it, what's it shooting at? It's shooting at a state, the state of satisfaction. Whereas people don't want to be in a state. They want to be active. And this is something that my former colleague, the great Bob Nozick, said about if you imagine a utility machine, it could produce amazing and terrific satisfactions. But suppose you were hooked up to it and just didn't do anything, but you had this illusion that you were doing these things and therefore you felt great satisfaction most people would not choose to be plugged into that machine because they want to strive and they want to do whatever they do by being agents in their own lives. And utilitarianism misses the importance of agency. So for these reasons, we reject utilitarianism and then we, we get on to our own view, which is much more pluralistic. And therefore, the human development reports that SEN helped to construct measure many different things. And countries can go to the top, not by having any one thing. You can just look at the different achievements in, in lots of different areas. And then what I did was to turn that into a kind of minimal theory of justice. A society is minimally just only if it's been able to get people up above a certain threshold on 10 very basic kinds of things that include life, health, bodily integrity, the development of their senses, imagination, and thought, through education and political liberties, and, and on and on goes the list. But in any case, that's the sort of thing that you could imagine a constitution protecting in a variety of much more concrete ways. And that's the reason I developed it, because I think countries often are kind of formulating their constitutional principles. And it, it really is, I, my view was inspired by thinking about the Indian constitution and the South African constitution, but having learn from those, then I hope I can recommend something that new nations might want to consider. And now I just have a final question, because as we were chatting before we started this interview, you mentioned to me that you're writing a book about opera next. Um, now, you've written about a great many different subjects, so it's less surprising in your case than it might be in some. Um, you know, as I mentioned to you, my mother is a classical music conductor who's conducted a lot of opera in her life, more opera than anything else. I myself um, 
uh, was slightly traumatized in childhood by her uh, friends asking me casually, what instruments do I play with a subtle <laughs> emphasis on the S and having to answer that I play none at all, because sadly, the musical gene has not uh, been passed down to me, or perhaps it skipped a generation and will grace my future children. Um, but what is it about opera that you're writing about? Why should we uh, care about opera if we're not already fans? Okay, well, first of all, I'm a lifelong music lover and an amateur singer, and I just love music in, in many different forms. But And in my book about the emotions, Upheavals of Thought, in 2001, I wrote quite a good deal about emotions of, in, in, in music, and I talked particularly about Mahler. So it's not only opera. And I should also say that between the Animals book and the opera book, I wrote a small book on Benjamin Britten's War Requiem to think about how a work of music can help us think about war and peace and it's dedicated to the people of Ukraine. So anyway, it's uh, it's a, a book that will come out in the fall. But opera has been my particular favorite, largely because I am a, an amateur singer, and I love the human voice as a medium of expression. And I've taught for years a, a course in opera with Anthony Freud, the now current, but he's soon to be former general director and CEO of Lyric Opera of Chicago. He's a wonderful man. He's a great teacher, and our class is called Opera as Idea and as Performance, where we say, well, there's some people who sit and read the score and listen to the recordings. That's me. But there are other people who bring in the set designer, the costume designer, all the things that make it a multimedia art, and that's Anthony. So I hope that whoever succeeds him will want to teach that class with me again. But in any case, over the time, I started out writing program notes for them, being their Mozart expert, because I'm really a long-time lover of Mozart's operas, and I think they're a form of Enlightenment political thought. So that's the basic core of the book, is to develop that idea that Mozart's operas, not the libretto so much, and sometimes actually the libretto is in tension with what he's doing musically, but the music is an experience of various Enlightenment Values. He was a passionate Freemason, and the Freemasons themselves thought that their that music was a, an essential part of being a free citizen of the Republic of the Future. So the book is called The Republic of Love. It's in contrast to a prior book of mine that was called The Monarchy of Fear. So it's trying to show how Mozart in his works has created a culture that shows the possibility, at least, of a republic based on mutual brotherly love. And so I do this in a complicated way over a number of different operas, some of which are more problematic than others. But then in the second half of the book, which I'm just writing, starting to write now, I say, well, but you know, Mozart was a rather optimistic person and he didn't really see certain obstacles to his way of thinking that modern society does see. What about society's use of prisons and torture and the death penalty. And so, so I look at you know Beethoven's Fidelio, at Jake Heggie's Dead Man Walking, as, as operas that take up the challenge of thinking well about prisons, torture, and the death penalty. But then, and this is the chapter I'm actually writing now based on a previous program note, Mozart underestimated the power of religion. That's what we were talking about before. He did think, I think, that everyone would become a Freemason and we wouldn't have superstitious fear and the superstitious call to retribution, which was what he particularly hated and opposed throughout his works. And so, you know, we don't see that. And uh, Verdi's Don Carlos is what I'm writing about now, a, a very deep and penetrating look at how a certain religion, and of course he was talking in the libretto about an earlier version of the Catholic Church, the Inquisition, but he was really talking about his own time, Pius IX and his syllabus of errors and his dogged opposition to the Republican movement in Italy, of which Verdi was the leading proponent. So he's thinking, you know, the trouble is that people are afraid and they religion can get a grip on their minds through fear, but then also through resentment. And he shows how religion drives the, we, the weaker people feel the more they want to attack and get the better of other people. And we see this in this tremendous auto da fe scene in Don Carlos, where, of course, the 
church is getting you to urge that the heretics be burned at the stake. And opera can show this better than straight theater because straight theater can't really show you the way crowds behave. Julius Caesar tries to do that, but it's not terribly successful. But Verdi was the great master of the chorus and choral emotions. And he really has some, he's onto something very powerful about the interconnection of weakness, fear, and the desire for revenge on your enemies. It's something we need to think about now, I think more than ever, because we have a politics that's increasingly driven by a kind of resentment and hatred, a hatred of vaguely specified others. So anyway, that's what I'm writing there. And then I go on through several other problems, but I end up with Verdi again, because Mozart died at a very young age, and he didn't think about the problem of how can you be a Republican citizen as you're growing older. And Verdi wrote this fantastic, happy comic opera, Falstaff, at the very end of his life when he was 80, and he was he died a few years later. And he was really showing in that opera, and it's his only, well, he had an early comic opera that was a total flop, but at, apart from that, it's his only comedy. And it's a wonderful comedy, showing the love of life and how we should respect people who are older, even if they're fools, and even if they're making lots of mistakes, because they have this passion for life. And so at the end of the opera, Falstaff says, well, you mean, and he's been thoroughly humiliated by the wives of Windsor. But nonetheless, he says, I'm a cause of merriment in other people. And that's how we, you should accept me. So I you know as somebody who's growing older myself, I think it contains this fizzy love of life that helps us think respectfully about the aging people in our societies. Mm. Because, you know, our societies do not respect aging people. Every time I go to the doctor, I have to choose whether I tell them who I am or whether I don't. And if they know who I am because it's a university hospital, then they tend to be a little bit respectful. But if they're just any old 75-year-old person, you know, they're very disdainful. And there's a lot of research on this, on how people who are aging are treated with condescension. So I, I really feel that is a problem for a republic based upon love. We have to love the bodies of aging people, and we don't. And so I, I feel that was a good place to end the book. Mavon Bon, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure.